The following program contains graphic material and subject matter that may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. very close family unit. There are three of us kids. Um, Danny was the oldest. I'm the middle child and we have a younger brother. Our parents were both ski patrollers up at Big Sky and so we had the privilege of growing up on the mountain which was amazing and what an incredible place to you know learn uh, to be tough and to be outdoorsmen. We spent a ton of time then in the summer times hiking in the Gallatin Canyon, river rafting all over the place, just spending a lot of time outdoors. Someone killed Danny. I've always known that there's no way that this was an accident. Someone was there with my sister and someone did this to her. Danny had this crazy dry sense of humor and everybody loved her, right? Like she could put anyone at ease. As soon as you met Danny, she's cracking jokes and you know, eventually you knew that she really loved you if she started playing tricks on you because that's just who she was. She was fun to be around um, and she definitely uh, made the room come alive. Danny was also a really good student. She was super smart. She was a uh, who's who of American high school students. And she was the person I wanted to be like, you know? She was cool, man. It was the 90s and she was, you know, into grunge music and rock and roll. And so of course I'd go steal her CDs. She'd find them like in my room. And then of course, you know, I'd get a good smacking around the ear because what are, you know, big sisters for, other than to beat you up a little bit. I wanted to be like her. She just made you feel like you could walk into the room being whoever you were gonna be, and she would still love you for that. The day that Danny died was the fall festival, um, the fall equinox festival that's in Belgrade. I remember being over at the park with my friend, and uh, my dad came over. I remember being over at the park and my dad came over and told me that she was missing. And I was scared as hell. I'm Cindy Botek, formerly Deputy Crawford, the Gallant County Sheriff's Office. Danny left the residence uh, where they lived in the city limits of Belgrade at about 11.30. Danny told her mom, Cheryl, she wanted to go to Cameron Bridge fishing access for a while. Um, Cheryl gave Danny her own watch and told her to be home by two because the family was having friends over. And when she didn't show up, mom went out there with her friend to look for her and found the truck there, but didn't find Danny. She found her keys in her water bottle um, on a trail adjacent to the parking area. That was 
really such a scary indicator. She was a proud new driver, and it was just really unlikely that she would have dropped those things um, unless something bad had happened. Right away we saw the keys in a water jug laying right in the path. I uh, immediately felt a knot. It wasn't normal. Um, I started running around, screaming hard, looking. But I'm in a panic state, I guess. You know, checking the bathrooms. I noticed that the, the truck was unlocked with, you know, her CDs, Rex's computer, I mean, all this stuff in there. Is that unusual for her? Extremely unusual. She knows that that's important stuff, so she would never just leave it unlocked. That approximately 13 minutes after 5 p.m., uh, Belgrade resident Cheryl Houchins contacted the Gallon County Sheriff's Office and requested assistance in locating 15-year-old Danny. I'm Sergeant Matt Boxmeyer. I work for the Gallon County Sheriff's Office in the Detective Division. Cameron Bridge Fishing Access falls in the jurisdiction of the Gallon County Sheriff's Office, and so deputies responded out there. Um, I think it was approximately an hour later is when they called search and rescue in to continue the search. We got a call um, of a missing person um, down at the Cameron Bridge Fishing Access. And we went down there, um, found her car, and we started searching. We started at the road and uh, started going south from there. It's what we call a grid search where everybody can be side by side and you can see each other and see the ground in between you. We searched that all the way to where her vehicle was parked, and then uh, it became dark. The river's right there, there's a lot of little water traps, um, beaver holes that you can fall into and break a leg pretty easy. Um, we felt for our searchers that it was safer to proceed again in the morning. So we started buttoning things up and left. And the search party was called off. It's really hard, obviously, in a thick area to be able to do a lot of searching in the dark, and it gets very dark here. However, there were family friends who remained on searching a little bit later that night. Um, one of my dearest friends, his family lived really close to Cameron Bridge, and so uh, they continued searching. The two individuals that located Danielle um, were brothers. They're from the Belgrade area. One of the brothers had, had received a phone call from his son, who was really good friends with Danielle's little sister, Stephanie. And the son pled with his dad to go out and look for Danielle because both him and his brother knew the fishing access well. They grew up there. They spent a lot of time out there. Um, and it was under the son's insistence that he went out there. phone rings, it's my son. He's at the basketball game with his buddies. He says, Dad, you gotta get down to the river. I said, what for? He says, Dad, Stephanie's sister's missing and they're, the search and rescue's down there looking for him and you need to go help him. And I said, Bud, you know, it's like, a, Dad, you gotta, come on, Dad. And I said, all right, you know. So I hauled Bud down to Cameron Bridge. He had a flashlight. He searched with his flashlight for a little while and the batteries went dead. Uh, he went to his brother's house, which was fairly close. His brother agreed to come back out with them. So they went into town, got some more batteries, and then they returned out there. At this time, all the search and rescue personnel had left for the night um, and they felt like they 
just needed to keep looking. And we had been there about 45 minutes. I was just getting ready to tell him, let's go. I said, man, what are we doing here? And, he, and then he just said, I found her. So I got closer and I looked and I seen her, the back of her head. And my whole body went really weird and I just, I knew she was dead. She's dead. I think those brothers were um, really affected when they found her. And I think they probably have that image of her blazoned in their minds. And God only knows what will remind them of that, but I'm sure it comes to their mind till this day. As soon as I realized it was her, I got real scared. I went back and got in a car, and then we driving out, and then another guy come in in a truck. And uh, he said he was the dad. My dad had returned one last time before coming home that night um, to Cameron Bridge. And as he was going in, um, you know, for that final look, uh, the person who found Danny was coming out. Um, and so he let him know right away that he had found Danny and um, that she was dead. He came home and I remember mom was standing in the um, laundry room, probably anxiously doing laundry, you know, keeping her hands busy. And uh, I was in my bedroom and I, he came in and I remember him saying to mom that, you know, Danny's gone. And uh, mom, ever the optimist, was like, no, they're, they're gonna find her. They're gonna find her in the morning. And he said, no, they, they found her, she's gone. I remember walking out into the living room. They grabbed me and we hugged and we just collapsed to the floor. And uh, nothing's ever been the same since. up after the break. She was face down, looked like she'd been drug in there. Personally, I feel that whoever did this knew Danielle. He knows so much more than he's telling, so much more. Somebody killed Danielle out there. Why, I don't know. Uh, I've been in search and rescue for 35 years. You know, anytime you deal with a body, it sticks with you. She was face down, her shirt and bra were pulled up to her neck, and um, she was covered in mud, a lot of mud. Danny's body was face down in a swamp area. Her face was fully submerged in the water and her left arm was um, up above her head, her right arm down towards her side. Her mom's watch was found like this. And she was underneath, she was underneath the growth. Okay, go ahead and move the weeds away. It was a big willow, I remember. It was very low to the ground, the limbs. So you had to crawl on your hands and knees to get in there. She was drugged there. I know she was drugged there. That's how the watch got there. It's almost like somebody maybe was trying to hide her, um, at, least for, at least for the time being. She was missing one of her sandals. Uh, that sandal was found the next day, farther away from her body. 
Her hair was loosely secured in a ponytail by an elastic hairband, uh, loosely, meaning it was probably nice and tight when she left that morning, but something ruffled up her hair, although it was still secured. They took Danielle to the Montana State Crime Lab in Missoula for an autopsy. She did have some injuries, bruises, scrapes. Um, they were on her head, the back of her neck, front of her face, her legs. I remember the scratches. You know, she's got them over here, which uh, happens um, if you're trying to get someone to get their hands off of you from behind, or if you're running, maybe running away from somebody in uh, a wooded area. There was injury to her um, genital area, which is indicative of some, some type of sexual trauma. Interesting part, the laryngeal lumen contains an abundant material consistent with mud, which means we found mud down in here, which means she took, she <gasps> in, inhaled mud. She had mud that had gone down inside of her esophagus and into her uh, stomach. Cause of death, drowning, manner of death, undetermined. Why they left it is undetermined, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. I would have listed this as a homicide. At the time, the sentiment was so strong that we don't know what happened. We just don't know. I guess she just went out there and laid down and died. How can you read this report? How can you read that autopsy report and think that she just laid down there and died? Especially when the toxicology comes back and she didn't have anything in her system that's gonna cause her to completely black out. Danielle was not intoxicated. Danielle was not on any type of drugs. She didn't have anything in her system besides caffeine. We were told that Danny drowned in just a shallow amount of water. Danny was strong and athletic. She was a skier and a climber and a great swimmer. We have natural defense mechanisms, even as babies, um, to not take water into our lungs or mud. She didn't just die out there. She didn't just walk out there and die. She was killed. Somebody went out there and met with her and they held her down in that water and she drowned. She didn't do this to herself. It wasn't an accident. She didn't fall down and get hurt. It wasn't a suicide. Based on the evidence at the scene, someone did this to her. There were quite a few people ruled out, um, quite a few people interviewed. It was mentioned at the time that it was possibly some, some type of stranger thing, um, someone lurking around the area. You know, we, Cameron Bridge fishing access is close to I-90, but the, the clues left at the crime scene lead me to believe that this is, this is somebody she knew. Approximately 30 yards from where we just came, the initial print was found. Right in this area that I'm zooming in is where some of those first prints were found, looking north. Stranger abductions and stranger murders are very uncommon. Personally, I feel that whoever did this knew Danielle. Shortly after um, Danielle's murder, there was a couple of viable suspects. One of those suspects, we believe he may have some information that he doesn't want to share with us. At least one person that um, I interviewed, I know, or I have very, very strong s suspicion that he knows so much more than he's telling, so much more. And um, it drives you crazy when you look someone in the eye. And they, they know that you know that they're lying and they just smile away. And that just drives you crazy, especially in a case like this. During the autopsy, they found some foreign hairs on Danielle's body. 
the hairs that, that were located were naturally shed arm hairs. Uh, they were inconsistent with Danielle's hair. They were found on her underwear. They were brown in color and they did not have root material on them, so they were naturally shed. Those um, hairs were um, compared to known hair standards from friends and family. We haven't found a match so far. Back when this occurred, I don't believe our crime lab was using DNA at the time. If they were, it was very, very new. Nowadays, they have advances in technology. They can do mitochondrial DNA on the actual shaft of the hair if you don't have a root. All those hairs that were examined back in 1996 um, are going to be sent to a private lab to have them reanalyzed. Advancement in the technology is really, really, really going to, that's what's going to solve this case for us, absolutely. Someone did this to Danny, and I can almost guarantee they probably said something about it to somebody. You may think that a detail is inconsequential, or a conversation you had with someone was minor and couldn't make a difference, but unequivocally, it can. We were kids. I was 12, Danny was 15, her friends were right in that age, 15, 16. Maybe you got interviewed by the sheriff's department and they were scary. God knows I was scared. But we're all adults now. We have our own lives. We have our own careers, our own hurts. I just want to ask anyone who thinks that they have a small detail, small to big, to reach out. And if that person can find the courage to come forward, They can help me heal. There are people out there that know what happened to Danielle. She deserves justice. She deserves to be heard. It just tears me apart and it hurts. It hurts all the time. Um, I think about her, but I don't mind because it's part of what gives me purpose. I've been thinking about this quite a bit. And I Kind of one of those, you start knocking the cobwebs off and start thinking about it again, which you try to forget them. I want the public, I want everyone to know that Danielle was loved. Her parents still love her. Her brother and her sister still love her. For 24 years, they've had zero closure. Danielle had a whole life ahead of her, and that was taken from her. And no one deserves to die alone in the manner that she died. My family hasn't given up on Danny. Her friends that were closest to her have not given up on Danny. And the Gallatin County Sheriff's Department has not given up on Danny. I think that there's, a, there's an individual that did it, and I think there's an individual that, that knows about it. Um, they were either there, they helped, or they were told about it shortly after. But I'm very, very hopeful with the new DNA process that we'll be able to get a match. Danielle deserves to be heard. Danielle deserves to not be forgotten about. Danielle deserves for somebody to care about her enough to say, I've kept my mouth shut for way too long and it's time. And now's the time. We want to make sure that her memory doesn't die. I can't walk away anymore. It's not good for me. It hurts. We love her. And we want to make sure that her story is able to be told without pain by seeking the answers that she so deserves.